Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Haddonfield United Methodist Church. I love the hustle and bustle of the back room. I love that people come in and just want to socialize and have some fellowship before service, so it makes me feel alive. I know that. Well, we were so happy that you're here, whether you're here in person, in the front room, in the back room, online, we welcome you today. So let's stand together and sing our opening song, I Thank God. What? to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. And I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I Good morning. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Good morning. I'm just going to keep talking, see if you can hear me. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Can you all hear me? Sure. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you uh, with us here in worship. We welcome you in this space. Um, well, I think last week I celebrated the fact that we have a whole new system of technology in this room. Uh, so grace abounds, right? 
I mean, we're, it's always a lot of learning. And, um, and we, I am very grateful for all of our volunteers that make this stuff happen, and it's amazing what they do. But today, as we come into this space, I'm so grateful that you're here. There's a spirit of excitement in the air because tomorrow um, we are going to begin our Vacation Bible School program for the year. Yeah, we can give God a shout out for that. Uh, we know that folks kind of anticipate this for a year, uh, and I think we have 165 kids signed up for tomorrow, and about 200 volunteers, or no, 100 volunteers, 100 volunteers, and um, we're going to bless our volunteers uh, later in the service, but today, right after this service, if you have a moment to just help us stack some chairs, it will help us prepare to get this room ready. So before we leave this space, if all the blue chairs could be put away, that would be great. If you, if, if you are able today uh, around noon to come back to church to help us decorate for Vacation Bible School, we would really appreciate that. We're having a decorating party today, if you will, around lunchtime. There's uh, information on page 8. We're also uh, accepting financial or uh, monetary dono donations for Bible school. On page 8, you'll see how to do that because there are always supplies and things that come up in the middle of the week and last minute. So we appreciate everyone who's already supported in that way. Uh, for folks who are with, with us online, we are grateful for you, and we want to invite you to go to haddonfieldumc.org slash now. You'll see some of the announcements I'm mentioning, also the sermon notes for later in the service. Uh, our mission collection this summer is a backpack and school supply collection. Uh, every year as we get ready for the school year, we donate supplies to a few of our mission partners, the Neighborhood Center in Camden, uh, Respond Inc. in Camden, uh, Ascenda, which is throughout the state of New Jersey, and I think there might be another partner in there. Page 8 and 9, we have a list of supplies that we're collecting. And there's also a little QR code you can scan to support that. And that's one of the ways that, of course, we shop for our kids and for our family, but, but not everyone has the supplies that they need. And this is a way that we make sure that all kids have what they need for school. Uh, just two other things real quick is that we normally have coffee with the pastor the second week of the month, and we're, um, we're going to skip that in favor of getting ready for Vacation Bible School, and that will be back in the fall, in October, that will resume. And the last thing is that for this summer, we have had um, an amazing intern doing uh, digital and video ministry, Joel Shahosky. And Joel, can I invite you to the, uh, up here to the stage? I don't know if he's prepared for that, but... Uh, we actually were able to get a, a grant through the state of New Jersey and uh, have Joel be a, an intern through our Department of Education. And uh, Joel's been with us just two months, but has done a lot of awesome work and helped us to get acclimated to our equ equipment. And Joel is going to Widener University in this week? Yes. Just, just this week. And so we want to thank Joel. And uh, I, I'm just going to say a prayer blessing for your uh, school year. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for Joel and all that he has done and all that he will do. Do a mighty thing in his life. Bless him as he begins uh, college and travel with him and go with him wherever he, he uh, goes. God, may you love him and may you offer grace and beauty through his life and his work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's thank Joel for his work. Thanks. Now, as we continue to worship our good God, I invite you to stand as you're able and let's sing. So I'm really glad that Chris mentioned Vacation Bible School because in the first, second verse, I don't know, one of the verses in that last song, I found myself doing the turn me around, feet on, what, what's going on with my hands? It's VBS week and my body's like, yo, we got to do all these things. I am so excited for VBS. But before VBS, friends, we get to worship a little more. Um... When I saw the set list this week and I saw that we get to do praise again, y'all, I'm so excited. You know me, I love a good song. Let's go. I praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. Sing with us, everybody. I'll praise when I'm sure. surrounded I see y'all is the water my worries drowning as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord of my soul praise the Lord of my soul 
bring it down. We're going to sing a song that's called What He's Done. See, on a hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. Sing with me. flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice, what he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven, my future is Friends, uh, today we have the joy of welcoming in new members in the life of our church. And in total, I think we're going to welcome 17 new members between this service and the next. And if you look in your bulletin, you'll see a list of those that are joining uh, in this service. So I want to invite the folks who are joining today uh, to come on up, for, come forward. You can come on the stage through that entrance or the, either side, either side. And as they come up, I want to offer uh, gratitude to Dan Cummings, a uh, member of our church who has handmade crosses for our new members. It has a little, uh, has a little instructions on it. But Dan has, uh, in his own woodworking shop, made this cross for our members to, to have. And uh, so I invite folks to just, you can come on up and.
We didn't rehearse this part. So you can fill in the middle. You can come come on in, and uh, it's good to have you guys here. So, uh, membership in the life of the United Methodist Church is rooted in our baptism. When we're baptized, if we're children, parents answer questions on our behalf. And then when we're confirmed in the church, we get to answer those questions for ourselves. And so here, when we join the church, we get a chance to revisit those baptismal vows. And so uh, I ask you all the questions of your baptism that are going to be behind me. <laughs> so friends, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, those uh, joining today, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord, who in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. the whole congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both of your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Yes. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's, With God's help, help, we, we will, will proclaim, proclaim the, the good news and live, and live according, according to the example of Christ. Of Christ. We will we'll surround these persons, persons with, with a community, community of love and, and forgiveness. forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. And now, friends, uh, as new members of this church, I ask you these questions. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. And as members of this congregation, Haddonfield United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. So friends, we are so delighted, and I'm sorry that I'm turning my back to you. Uh, we're still figuring out our stage dynamics in this iteration. But we are delighted to have you and your families and your spirit among us. Um, I have been asked if you would identify yourselves. You don't have to talk into a mic, but just wave to our congregation. Because folks say, we see names, we see faces, but we don't know who people are. So as I uh, read your name, if you just wave uh, to folks so we know who you are. Anthony Aroth. Uni and Kelly Coyle, Curtis and Megan Farrow, John and Marsha Reed, Lindsay Paul Summers, Devin Stutzman and Katie Stutzman, Emily and William Torres. Welcome. These are your new siblings in Christ, and how do we welcome them? So I heard you promise to pray for them and nurture them in their life of faith. So make sure you get to greet them if you see them after the service. Friends, thank you and welcome.
I invite Pastor Chris to come forward as well for the commissioning of Vacation Bible School volunteers. How many of you are volunteering for Vacation Bible School? Raise your hand. How would you all feel about standing in the front of the stage? Why don't you come on forward? Let's thank them. Wow. I want to be very bold today, and I want to say one of the problems with our Vacation Bible School is that our folks have become too good at it. Uh, our volunteers and, and our staff, especially Julie Robertson, who leads our children's program here, have gotten so good and have raised the bar that we keep getting questions and, and requests, right? And I think it's because uh, people care so much and bring them whole, their whole selves, and our kids just have a real blast. And so I, I'm excited to begin a new year with you all. Believe it or not, I do games. I have no idea how I got it wrapped into that. It's probably the worst thing that, you, that I could do. But uh, to this year, Lisa is going to be my partner. And, and we have a chance in Vacation Bible School to make new friends because we're partnered with people. We meet new volunteers. We meet the kids. And so we just I'm going to ask Pastor G-Sun in a moment just to pray for our volunteers and also to pray for all the kids who are going to be here tomorrow. So if you would just extend your hand as a sign of, of blessing and laying on of hands, we'll pray. A loving and gracious God, thank you so much for each of us here who will spend a week proclaiming your love and hope in children's heart in this building. Oh Lord, bless our heart and mind and bless our words and bless how we show up during the week and help us to be filled with your joy as we serve together your community as we build up the community. We are so grateful for each children who will join us. We are grateful that you give us this opportunity to serve the surrounding area, surrounding community, and help us to be the sign of hope. Bless children's hearts as they experience how good it is to walk with you and walk with each other in, on their journey, and how much help, the, help them to experience how much you love them. Keep us safe. Give us new strength each day. Help us have a lot of fun. Uh, in your name with each other. We pray all these in the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Amen. And thank you all. You can have a seat. I, yes, we can give. We can. My heart is filled with joy and excitement. And I know physically it's going to be... <laughs> A little bit a uh, hard week too because we are gonna spend uh, three hours with the kids and they are so energetic and so we need a new strength each and every day uh, and I'm grateful that God is gonna lead us and I'm grateful that we are a part of this ministry as God calls us to be and so whether you volunteer or not how you support the Vacation Bible School please keep all the kids and volunteers in your prayer each morning we need your prayers. And whether this is your first time to join us or many times to worship with us, I know God is welcoming you in this loving, um, in God's loving presence. And at this moment, we want to take a pause and center ourselves and lift up our prayers before God who is listening to us before we say a word. So I invite you to take a, uh, invite you to close your eyes. And take a deep breath. Breathe in and breathe out. Feel God's loving presence in and among us. Lift up your concern. Lift up your prayers. Lift up your gratitude. I thank God for the laughter. God provide. I thank God for each of your presence as we worship together, as we praise together. Would you please join your heart with mine in prayer? O oh, loving and gracious God, we thank you so much for this beautiful summer day, revealing yourself to us and inviting us to worship 
you in your lobbying presence. We are here to worship you. We are here to praise you. We are here because we love you. We have so much things. We are so grateful and give thanks to you. Thank you for the new members joining us. Thank you for Vacation Bible School, the opportunity for us to serve the kids in surrounding area. Thank you for each other as we share our journey together as we grow in love. We long for you. We search for you. Let us experience the depth of your love and the warmth of your grace in this moment. We ask your help as we grow in love every step of the way. Help us to know the light of the world who stepped down into darkness to be with us and how deep it is, your love. Help us proclaim your goodness and faithfulness to the people around us each and every day in our words and actions, decisions, and steps. Oh God, let our lives be a fragrant offering on the journey of a transformation of our hearts and lives. And let us build your church by, by being kind to each other, by forgiving each other, by following your way of love as Jesus taught us. Oh, Lord, we pray for each other as you promise to hear us when we cry out to you. We lift up our worries and concerns. We lift up our fear and anxiety before you who know what concerns our hearts is before we say a word, who know our deep pain and sorrow, and who know our hopes and dreams. For those who need your wisdom, provide more than enough to follow your guidance in their life. For those who suffer from their health concerns, touch their body, mind, and spirit with your healing hands at this moment. Release your grace of peace and comfort on your children who are mourning the unexpected loss of their loved ones. Oh Lord, have mercy on us and hear our prayers. We are perfectly imperfect. Yet we are all called to love you and love each other. And so but sometimes we confess that we are overwhelmed by the division and hostility in our reality. But we trust you. You are at work for good for those who love you. Surround us with your love and care. Let us grow in mutual respect, love, and forgiveness. Let your peace be on earth as it is in heaven. We mourn for the victims of violence around the world, especially children and their family. Oh, Lord, be with them and let your peace be real in their lives and have mercy on us. Lord, we pray all these, our spoken and unspoken prayers of heart, in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who loves us more than we can imagine. And we pray together with the word that Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. The word of God for us today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25, through chapter 5, verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, I want to call your attention to our sermon notes on page 6. If you'd like to turn there, follow along. We have some fill-in-the-blank questions. If you have a pen or a pencil, um, you can go deeper in the message through active listening. So I invite you to check that out. For folks online, you can find that at haddonfieldumc.org slash now. Um, that's always current, and you can find the sermon notes there. Well, I'm curious today if you have ever had to give something up from your diet or cut out a behavior in your life. Number one, anyone had to do that? If you were successful, what made you be so? What leads to the successful elimination of things from our lives? What I hear over here? Persistence and replacement. Yeah, we always cut to the to the right answer first, right? So when we give something up, it, I have found it is easier when we replace it rather than simply subtract it from our lives. A number of years ago, I had to give up wheat and gluten from my diet for medical reasons. Now, I had recently discovered a passion for making French bread at home. I had gone to France a number of times and fallen in love with the boule. I don't know if you've ever had real French boule. I don't know if you know how that's made, but my favorite bread, I can just smell it, is if you put a pan of water underneath it in the oven while it bakes, it creates a crispy crust, and it's soft in the inside. Can't you just see the cross at the top and the sprinkle the flour? To, oh, it's amazing, right? <laughs> I bought baking stones. I bought all kinds of things, and I also got into um, friendship bread, sourdough, right, that you just keep multiplying and feeding. What I didn't know is that I was poisoning myself and making myself very sick, and I had to give that up. And, you know, when you just try and stop something you love, it's not easy. Not only is it not easy, you eventually will fail, I found, unless you find a way to get passionate about something else. So I started to make my own hummus. I started to learn other interesting recipes for things that were better and healthier for me. We got into making quinoa salad and all kinds of other sort of uh, things that were good for me instead of bread. Because to stop one thing leads a void, but to fill that void with something else that you can really get into sets us up for success. So when the Apostle Paul tells the church in Ephesus, and I think the church today, that we should put away certain things, my big question for Paul might be like your question, which is, that sounds great, Paul, but how? How? Paul says in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. I want, you to, I want us to focus on that list for a moment. Think about, it. have you seen any expressions of bitterness, of wrath, right? Revenge, getting back, making things right. Anger, slander, which is what? Gossip, reputation damage, saying bad things about others, together with malice. What is malice? You want Bad things to happen to another person. You want them to get what they're deserving, right? And, and I, don't, I don't have to give you any examples. I know that we swim in a sea of malice. Paul says, put it away. Yeah, okay, Paul. How? How? Well, 
first of all, I want to look at the context in which Paul writes this. He's writing to the church in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. It was a trade city, and it was known for creating a lot of religious items and idols. There was a big temple for a pagan god in Ephesus, and Paul eventually was driven out of Ephesus by the silver union workers, the trades uh, union, the equivalent of such a thing, in those days ultimately drove Paul out because as the Christians grew, the sale of silver idols went down, right? So that's the kind of place Paul was living in. There's a lot of interreligious and intercultural hostility. The church that Paul himself had planted there in Ephesus was made up of Jewish Christians as well as Gentile Christians. And in this letter, Paul says amazing things like Christ has broken down the dividing wall, which is the hostility between us. He says if you follow Christ, we put away the hostility. There's no, no more your people, my people, your way, my way. We are one in Christ. And he also answers this big question. The church was struggling with, could you follow Jesus without first becoming Jewish? Could you be a Christian without first being circumcised and practicing um, the law of the Torah? And Paul says that Christ abolished the law and created a new law of the Spirit. And the new law is founded not in, did you do this, did you not do this? It's, it's the law of love. And so Paul says that we all belong and we are one. And then he says, so stop bickering. Stop saying bad things about each other. Stop, put away all the animosity, all the hostility. You learn that from out there. But in here, let us take a different route. Let us model a higher law. And that is the law that Jesus taught us. But where does it come from? I, I realized that as I looked at this list, at, at what Paul is telling the people, he's actually teaching these non-Jewish Christians the basics of the Hebrew law. He says to them, first of all, he says, put away falsehood, right? And let us speak truth. Well, that's from the, the Ten Commandments. Which commandment is that? Put away falsehood. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That's easy. That's from the Hebrew law. Then he says, thieves must give up stealing. What's that? Thou shalt not. That was an easy one. Come on. And then, then he says, right? Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need. Well, where does that come from? Jesus, in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you hate someone in your heart, you are guilty of murder. Jesus says, if you say raka, which is a Greek word that means idiot, or fool. If you so much as say raka about another person, you have in your heart had hostility. So Rabbi Jesus is teaching us that the spirit of the law goes deeper than just, oh, well, I didn't kill anyone. Yes, but did you hate them, right? So Paul is mirroring Jesus and teaching the people to live by the law of love. So he puts, but the, the key is that when Paul says to put things away, put away hostility and bitterness and wrangling and slander, he also encourages the Ephesians to take something up in their place. If you look at, at the verses, he says, put away falsehood, okay, that goes away, and instead, let us speak truth to our neighbors, okay? You, and then he answers that question, well, isn't anger justified sometimes? Anger at war, anger at, anger at injustice, anger at violence, anger at harm to one another. And Paul would say, yes, he says, be angry, but do not sin. That sounds a whole lot like the book of James. James in chapter 1 says to us, be quick to listen, slow to speak, Slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Yes, you can have anger, but what do you do with it? John Wesley would say, do no harm. Do no harm. But as Paul says, put things away, he also asks us to take things up. Thieves must give up stealing. Okay, give it up. And, I, and you think, oh, no one here is a thief. But I think of the ancient world in which poor people survived by pickpocketing 
the wealthy and unjust tourists. I've traveled in the Middle East. It is an industry. People, poor people, and it, I'm very serious. People who otherwise would be honest have no way to feed themselves, but then to prey on unsuspecting wealthy tourists. It's an industry. I wonder if people in that industry were in Paul's church. He says, don't steal anymore, but take up. He says, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. It's not just enough to stop stealing, but what, what is the remedy? The remedy is think about other people. Think about people who are poorer than you are. Think about people who are hurting. So work honestly, not just so you can feed yourself, but so you can feed someone else. Don't just put it away, but take something up. This mirrors John the Baptist in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, John says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and produce fruits worthy of repentance. So, so John the Baptist says it's not enough just to repent of the bad things that you've done, but you must engage in work of restoration. Folks, here's, here's the dirty little secret today, that restoration and healing, it takes work. Has anyone here ever had to go to physical therapy? Right? If you've torn something, rest does not solve it, does it? What solves it? Motion. And so restoring the hurts of our lives and our relationships and our world is not just enough to ignore people. It's not enough to cut ourselves off from people who irritate us. We must engage in spiritual therapy, which is work. Produce fruits of repentance. And people ask John the Baptist, well, what is that? He says, it's easy. If you have two coats, give one away. He says, if you have defrauded someone, pay it back. He says that if you make a living on preying on other people, stop and only do that which is honest and take care of people. So Paul says to the church, put away bitterness and wrath and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, here, there's a little word that, that we can gloss over that is so important. And that word is and. And is crucial to changing our behavior. It is so easy for, my, for me to say, don't get caught up in all the nastiness that's, that's happening in an election year, right? Don't get caught up in slander and, and sharing your opinion really easily on your thumbs that you can't take back. It's easy for me to say to stop, but Paul says, we must take something up. The big question that when I preach about unity and Christ and loving our neighbor, folks constantly say to me, great message, I just don't know how. Well, I think we can learn something from the world of psychology and family therapy. Anyone ever heard of John Gottman? John Gottman is, is considered to be the father of family therapy or marriage therapy. And Gottman um, came up with some, a concept called the four horsemen. And there, in the Bible, in Revelation, there are four horsemen of the apocalypse. And they usher in when the end of the world and the return of Christ is coming. For Gottman, uh, who's a psychologist, not a preacher... Godman says that the four horsemen of relationships that are, th that are things that usher in the end of the relationship. If these things are present, all four together, they point to most likely this relationship is not going to be able to last. And, and it's not about predicting who's going to break up or who's going to stay together, but it's really about determining what interventions are needed. Right. So it's not about, oh, well, they're not going to make it. It's about if they don't do something immediately, they're not going to make it. So what interventions do we need to do? Well, first of all, let's look at the four horsemen of what I would call relationship apocalypse. Number one, criticism. Has anyone here ever been critical of their partner or of a family member? Right? You come home from work, you walk into the kitchen, and the first thing you say is, you didn't do the dishes. These were here this morning when I left. I thought you were going to do them, right? Simple. I've done it. Maybe this morning. You've done it, right? Criticism. Can you recover from criticism? Sure you can. But if it becomes a way of life, it leads to the next thing, which is contempt. The other partner says, I did the dishes yesterday. She doesn't appreciate it. 
She never appreciates anything I do. I took out the garbage. I clean the house. If I do the dishes, she's just going to ask me to do something else. It is the soundtrack in our minds in which we hold people in contempt, right? We get together with family members. They didn't ask about me. They didn't ask about my kids. They don't care about me. All they care about is their selves. Do you have soundtracks like that for people in your life? That is called contempt. Without knowing it, we hold people in contempt. And it's very hard for them to break out of that narrative, which can lead to the next thing, which is defensiveness. Has anyone here ever encountered defensiveness, right? I'm just trying to think, think of, of a moment of defensiveness, right, that's not too real. <laughs> did you do the dishes? Well, I did the dishes yesterday, right? We, we immediately, or, or turn left here. I know how to get to church, right? I drive there every week. I know how to drive. Think about the ways that we're defensive with people that we work with or people in our, in our communities or our lives or even our friends. When we get to the point of defensiveness, we can't really have good conversations because we feel that we have to defend ourselves, right? And we close in. Now, I have to say, all of these uh, four, of the three of the four horsemen are pretty common, but once you get to stonewalling, you really need to intervene. What is stonewalling? Hey, how was your day? Fine. Go into the room, close the door. Stonewalling is what we have become experts at in the United States. We cut people off. We recede. We stop talking. We unfriend. We delete. We move away. We don't invite. We stonewall people. We shut down and are no longer willing to have conversations because we already know what they will say and what they will do. And it comes from a place of defensiveness that developed from contempt, which came from criticism. And once you get to stonewalling, there is no more conversation. How can you heal from these four horsemen of relationship apocalypse? Well, Gottman says there are remedies, and you must, these do not happen naturally, right? I tore a rotator cuff many years ago. I could not get cereal in the grocery store for one year, right? I couldn't raise my, my arm. You don't recover from that stuff without doing work. And so we don't recover from a breach in relationship without doing the real work of restoration. And so Godman says each of these four horsemen has an antidote. And so the antidote to criticism is the gentle startup. When you come home from a long day, you see the dishes aren't done, instead of saying, hey, why didn't you do the dishes? First say, hello, how was your day? Seems like a no-brainer, right? But how often do we not do the gentle startup, the good morning, the pleasantries? Over time, keeping the gentle startup first can begin to unravel this sense that a person is always feeling criticized. Then the remedy to contempt is to build a culture of appreciation. What can you thank the other person for? I, I always say with 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 staff and working with people, always start with thank you. Don't think, I know church people are wonderful, but don't think I don't get the occasional nasty email, right? Occasional as in like every five hours, right? <laughs> I have learned that starting with authentic gratitude puts me in a different place to have a conversation with a person, right? So how do you do it? Someone is, is accusatory or critical. Thank you for caring about this community so much. I really appreciate your passion and why you're so concerned. However, right, then I can go in and try and disarm the situation. But if you don't start from a place of gratitude, the person might never hear you, right? You didn't take out the garbage, but I really appreciate that you made coffee today. Thank you so much. I, I learned in a previous church of how to, to interact with people who have dementia. I don't know if you've ever had someone who's had dementia in, in your life close to you. In my previous church, there was a woman named Mary. Mary was the matriarch of church matriarchs. She was a beautiful soul. She did a lot in the church, but Mary was developing dementia, and everyone could see it. 
It was happening in slow motion. And it was hard to interact with Mary. Because if you asked her questions, she might not know what day it is. And you couldn't talk about the future because she didn't know what you're talking about. And if you talked about the past, she might not remember. Another member, Margaret, whose mother had had Alzheimer's, taught me something very beautiful about how to interact with Mary. And Margaret said, I learned when my mom had Alzheimer's that it was all about creating beautiful moments. Right? It's not like... Hey, Mary, what are you going to do this summer? No, that doesn't work. And Margaret would say, Why, Mary, what a beautiful scarf you have. And Mary would perk up like magic. She would say, huh? Red's my favorite color. Right? And the moment might fade. Mary might not remember the compliment. But creating those moments pivots away from the sadness and the depressiveness of what it means to have dementia, and it focuses on the beautiful moments. When we are reaching across the aisle and working with people who have harmed us, starting to nurture a spirit of gratitude can disarm the hostility. Now, defensiveness, I have been defensive, right? The antidote to defensiveness is take responsibility. I'm sorry I didn't wash the dishes. I got preoccupied. I promise I'll wash them right after dinner, right? Take responsibility. And here, here are, are a couple words that I think is the undoing of our society today. Two words. But they. But they, right? Don't, don't get involved in that. Don't say anything nasty. But they said this, right? But they will never understand. But th that, that takes me back to adolescence, right? My mom always said, Chris, worry about Chris. Joe, worry about Joe. Why do I feel like we have to be parents to the church today and to society today? doesn't matter what they said. doesn't matter what they did. Take responsibility for what you did. If they said something nasty and you said something nasty, what, what's the result? You said something nasty, right? I don't care about they. What did I do? Take responsibility. Is it easy? Is it fun? No, it's work. It's the work of restoration. It's the work of healing. And here's the secret. It's the work of the church. It's the work of Jesus' followers to help heal the world. And the last antidote is physiological self-soothing. That's a big term. What, what does it mean? Take a walk, right? Now, I have been in conversations with family members in which I have had to quickly get off the phone. And sometimes when that happens, I really feel bad. Has anyone ever ha been in a conversation where you just decide it has to end, right? I sometimes feel badly about that, and sometimes I, I, I say to myself, I can't talk to them anymore, right? Physiological self-soothing is care for yourself. Sometimes you do need to end a conversation. Sometimes you need to take a walk. Sometimes you need to cool down. But the goal is always to return. The goal is always to return to the dialogue. Because if you, if you break the conversation and cut the person off, what's that called? That's called stonewalling, right? And the remedy to stonewalling is caring for yourself so that you don't say things that betrays your best interest. So you don't say things that cause harm. So you don't sin in your anger. Physiological self-soothing is literally whatever you need. A half a gallon of ice cream, a walk, a, a, an adult timeout, whatever. Take care of yourself with the goal of reengaging the relationship. Take a look at the list. It's in the sermon notes. The verse 31 and 32 is at the top. I want you to take a list, a look at this list. Bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice. We all agree that we know what these are and that we've seen them around us recently. Yes? I just want to, this is kind of off the cuff. Which one of these words do you struggle with the most? I'm going to read them aloud, and then I want you to tell me which word is the hardest. Bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice. Which word? Tell me. 
I heard bitterness. Tell me. Slander. That's my word, slander, right? Don't say something bad about someone. Well, but they, right? What other words? Malice. Well, just put it away. Just stop. Pastor, that's easier said than done. The work. Paul says, Paul says, be kind to one another. So when someone has cut you off and been a jerk, the Christian question that you ask yourself is this. How can I love on that person? What does love look like in this situation? And if you are quickly thinking about but they, remember that Jesus says, love your enemy and pray for those, right, who persecute you. What does kindness look like? Tenderhearted. What does the word tenderhearted mean? Compassion, right? When someone is, is just so dense and is just so toxic, think about what made them that way. Compassion goes to the root of why they are or what you can imagine why they are. And would you not have compassion on someone who is sick? What if that person is spiritually sick? Can you not have compassion on them in the same way as, as if they were ill? That's what tenderheartedness calls us to do. And then the last thing is forgiveness. But they didn't apologize. But they didn't confess. But they didn't take uh, responsibility, right? Does it matter? Who is freed when you forgive someone? Them or you? I think someone recently said, forgive our sins as we forgive the sins of others. Who said that? Oh, you said that just a few minutes ago, didn't you? Friends, I have to say, when I preach moralistic sermons like this, I kind of roll my eyes at myself. Because the last thing the world needs is another religious moral teacher to say, you need to do this, and you don't need to do this. So what I want to tell you is you need to know that I am always preaching in a mirror first. This stuff is hard for me. This stuff is hard for us. But do you know what it is? It's the work. It's the only work that's going to change things. It's the only work that's going to free us from contempt, and it's the only work that is going to free us to help heal the world. And when we heal the world, we are the church in a hurting world. Amen. Yes, that Sam beautifully read before. Uh, the phrase caught my attention was a fragrant offering. Have you ever, uh, did you wear a perfume today? In the, okay, not many of you? Okay, oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and the perfume, uh, you know, where, wherever, if you wear perfume, wherever you go for a period of time, pe people can sense and smell it, and uh, it's contagious. And in reality, you know, our generosity and our love and kindness and our uh, forgiveness is contagious. And, and also in reality, our bitterness, our anger, and our uh, scarcity is also contagious. As Pastor Chris reminds us and invited us how to choose how we live a life. And I I, I want to read the second verse, live in love with Christ, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And I know your offering is an expression of your faith and the fragrance offering to God. And so let us give generously as we build up the community of faith in and beyond in the building and as we become, uh, as we continue to become the sign of love and sign of hope. And our ushers will pass the offering plate in a second. And I want to remind you there is a way, various ways you can give. You can give online at headonfieldemc.org slash give. Or you can text the word give to the number on the screen. And where and whatever ways works for you, let us be generous. And let us uh, be uh, the 
the faithful disciple of Jesus to be a part of God's work in and among us. Let us continue to worship with the gift of giving and gift of music. What is done? What is done? All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. And I praise God for what He has done. See for the freedom He has won. Even death is dead and done. His life is overcome. Speak, say the name of our own names over every broken place. He is risen. future is heaven and I praise God for what Amen. As we close today, let's stand together and sing our final song. It's called And All the People Said Amen. as we leave this place today let us put away from us all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with malice 
And let us instead be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Let us go in God's love, grace, and peace to love and serve. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit.